Princess Margaret, a royal, a sometime rebel, and the runner-up. From the beginning, Margaret played second fiddle to Elizabeth. She once said to me, I never minded being the younger daughter, but I always minded the younger sister. But there was one place, 4,000 miles away, where Princess Margaret came first, the Caribbean island of Mystique. On Mystique, everyone treated her as if she was the most important person in the world. She was able to do things there that she couldn't possibly do at home. I think it did revolve around her. We always wanted her to enjoy herself. In this programme, Princess Margaret's lady-in-waiting and closest friend, Lady Anne Glenconner, reveals what life was really like during their times together on the island. In the early days... Every day we took a picnic to a different beach. We lived off sort of baked beans and things like that. And the heydays. She said, I've got flying mice in here. I know she liked to drink, but I didn't think she drank all that much. And insiders and experts discuss the glamour and excesses of Margaret's Caribbean retreat. The hedonism, the partying, the love affairs. People disappeared to the beach to have sex. This was the kind of extravagant thing that was to become typical. But her glitzy, mystique lifestyle would come at a price. The Queen said, what are we going to do about my sister's gutter snipe life? Every time she enjoyed somebody's company, she'd immediately said, oh, she's having an affair with them. And Margaret's decadent island life put her in the public spotlight for all the wrong reasons. There's a lot of criticism that she's off having a jolly in Mustique on the taxpayers' expense. But through all the highs and lows of her years on Mustique, it remained the one place that Margaret could escape from the shadow of her sister. It was the only place in the world where she actually had a home that she could call her own. January 1976. Princess Margaret arrived by private plane on the beautiful and secluded Caribbean island of Mystique. She was here to celebrate the 50th birthday of a close friend. But she was also escaping. Back home, Margaret's marriage to Tony Armstrong Jones, or Lord Snowden as he was also known, had broken down. He'd had numerous affairs, and Margaret needed to get away from London and from him. And Mystique was the perfect place. Tony became a serial adulterer. I started the rumours about your marriage. You know more about this than I do, I'm afraid. The media were already making much of the breakdown in the Snowdens' marriage. It wasn't just the media who were concerned. Her sister, Queen Elizabeth, had reached the end of her tether. The Queen had said to Prime Minister James Callaghan words to the effect of, what are we going to do about my sister's gutter snipe life? The trip to Mystique would give Margaret a chance to get away from all of her troubles and have some fun. Princess Margaret liked excess, and key to all this is that she was the centre of attention. The island was owned by Conan Tennant, later known as Lord Glenconnor, who had bought it in 1958 for £45,000. He'd always had this dream about having a proper island, I think. And Princess Margaret was so wonderful because she went along with Colin's dream. She encouraged it. Colin and Anne Glenconnor had always been part of Princess Margaret's social circle. Anne, his wife, was an extremely close friend of Princess Margaret, and uh, she also became a lady-in-waiting. I've known her, really, ever since I was about three. My family were always great friends of the royal families. Colin Tennant's 50th birthday was going to be a huge, excessive and glamorous party. He was an ace putting on parties, and he was really only happy when he was doing that. You could do whatever you like. People disappeared to the beach to have sex, skinny dipping in the sea, 
and this was the kind of extravagant thing that was to become typical. He was like a ringmaster, really, in a circus, arranging everything and controlling everybody and oh, don't do this and don't do that. The star-studded party was the epitome of opulence and a world away from the stuffy life of the royals back in the UK. It was like a, a big house party, really, and everything was gold. There was lots of photographs taken. Bianca Jagger uh, was brought in on a sort of golden litter, carried by some local boys that were completely naked except for a, co a golden coconut positioned in, a, in, in the right place. That was quite a sight. <laughs> And it really captures the spirit of the 70s and also the spirit of hedonism on the island. Colin was so extravagant. He even sprayed the grass gold. His wife, Lady Glen Connick, sprayed her face gold and then regretted it afterwards because it was deeply unflattering. It was terrible because every time I moved my face or smiled, the whole of my face was cracked in a very unbecoming fashion. And Colin kept on saying, aren't you enjoying yourself? I said, yes, I am, Colin, but I can't smile. <laughs> of course, the belle of the ball was Princess Margaret. She had the most uh, beautiful dress that we'd had made for her, so she was thrilled. Well, Margaret wears this amazing gold and white dress and she has a sort of gold and white turban on. It was Colin's party, but Princess Margaret ruled the roost, as she usually did on Mustique. It was a welcome break from the royal pecking order in Britain. From the beginning, Margaret played second fiddle to Elizabeth. I think it's really difficult for Margaret. You know, she is an extrovert, she's quite an alpha type, and I don't think she takes kindly to playing second fiddle. She once said to me, I never minded being the younger daughter, but I always minded the younger sister. On Mustique, she could be queen. Everyone kowtowed to her, everyone treated her as if she was the most important person in the world. I think it did revolve around her up to a point, you know, because Colin wanted her to be happy and we always wanted her to enjoy herself. But even though Margaret could relax and party on Mystique, she didn't want anyone to forget that she was royal. So people still had to curtsy and bow to her, even if they were um, in the bikinis. And there were stories of waiters having to swim out uh, to give her um, a cocktail. When she went swimming, because she was easily bored and insisted that people talk to her. One was deputed to swim with Princess Margaret. She had this beautifully coiffed hair, so she would swim very upright, um, doing a breaststroke, very, very slowly, looking ahead. And then I developed a sort of side stroke where I could keep up with her, doing a sort of doggy paddle with, with one hand. By the time of Colin Tennant's party, Mystique had become Margaret's very own pleasure kingdom, a center of glamour and excess, and a refuge from her troubles back home. But when she first visited, back in the early 60s, life on the island was shockingly different. Princess Margaret's love affair with Mystique started in 1960. She first visited the island during her honeymoon tour of the Caribbean with her husband. It is not only a delight, but a sort of miracle to arrive 5,000 miles from England and find oneself instantly and absolutely at home. In those days, the royals had these sumptuous honeymoons, always on board Britannia. She was very familiar with all those Caribbean islands and very at home with them. And the Caribbeans really liked her and kind of understood her. During the trip, Margaret's good friends, Colin and Anne Tennant, invited the couple to visit the island that they had just purchased, two square miles of mystique. I mean, the Britannia is quite big, it was nearly as big as the island, and it had to anchor quite far out. And uh, then suddenly I saw a little boat being lowered. 
And there we were on the beach, looking pretty, sort of scruffy, and these immaculate-looking sailors got out of the boat with a letter from Princess Margaret saying, um, you know, we've arrived, we long to see you. Mystique, in the early days, was very different to the other Caribbean stops on the royal tour. When they visited, it was just in its natural state of scrubland. The island was incredibly basic, didn't have really many people there, didn't have running water or electricity. The whole place would have been completely overgrown. She would have been bitten alive by mosquitoes. But, indeed, the sand was still white and lovely and the sea was a turquoise blue. Every day we took a picnic to a, a different beach. We set up a little tent, like a sort of Boy Scout tent, and uh, we spent the day there. And the food, I mean, you know, because the, the royal family always have the most delicious food and sort of tremendous chefs in their kitchens. And, we had one very old lady who really couldn't cook at all. Uh, or she just could open tins. And so we lived off sort of baked beans and things like that. But, um, you know, it, what was so lovely about Princess Margaret, people criticised her, say how difficult and spoilt she was. Well, she certainly wasn't spoilt when she first came to Musty. During their brief stay, Colin and Anne took Princess Margaret and Tony on a tour of the island. There were no cars. We had a tractor and a trailer. And when Princess Margaret came, uh, we uh, strapped uh, garden chairs onto the trailer. Over drinks that evening, Colin and Anne realised they hadn't got the couple a wedding present. Colin then turned to her and Tony and said, oh, ma'am, would you like something in a little box? Um, or would you like a piece of land? And she said, oh, I think I'd love a piece of land. I think he was quite surprised when she turned around and said yes, because I think he thought it was so wild and it was so remote and it was so, you know, far away and difficult to get to that he didn't think she would sort of take him seriously and take him up on it. Princess Margaret fell in love with the tiny island of Mystique, but her husband didn't. Tony didn't greatly care for the Glen Connors, so far as I understand it. And the land was given as a wedding present to Princess Margaret. It wasn't given as a joint wedding present. I mean, he wasn't interested at all. That was really the only time he ever went there. As Margaret left the little island that she'd fallen in love with, she had no idea when she'd be back. By the summer of 1968, Princess Margaret's marriage to Tony was going through a rocky patch. Rumours were rife of Tony's affairs, with men as well as women. And he was becoming less involved in Margaret's royal duties. It was said that their life together um, at Kensington Palace was a bit of a war zone. They were, had this very fiery relationship. They fight a lot. She was like a pressure cooker. She needed some kind of a safety valve. And it suddenly occurred to her that relief might come in the shape of Colin Tennant and Mustique. Margaret was thinking, I can get away from bloody Tony and, and all the girls he's sleeping with. Colin and Anne Tennant hadn't spoken to Princess Margaret about their gift of a plot of land on Mustique since her visit there in 1960. So when Margaret called them about it, it came as a surprise. Obviously, this barren piece of scrum was of absolutely no use to her without a house. Rather cheekily, she said, does a house come with it? When he and I were talking about this, and he actually said, well, I could hardly say no, could I? He said, so I ended up paying for the house. Margaret was famously tight-fisted. If she could avoid paying for something, she would. And, of course, she knew that uh, Colin Tennant didn't mind at all. You know, Colin w w wasn't a poor man. He had the money he could afford to do it. Towards the end of 1968, Princess Margaret flew out to Mustique to start making plans for her Caribbean home. 
Colin and I were very nervous about having to stay because, you know, I mean, she had been used to being, you know, living at Kensington Palace and Windsor and um, Sandringham and Balmoral, you know, and there she was going to stay. And at that time, our main house had burnt down and we were living in a sort of prefab. I mean, uh, it was really, really simple. And quite a journey to get there. You had to fly to Barbados and then fly to St Vincent and then had to take a boat. The sea is very, quite treacherous there, actually. It could be very choppy. The island was pretty wild still at this point. She just got stuck in. Roughing it on Mustique in those early days did mean just rigging up a sort of Heath Robinson contraption of a shower. She had to go outside, stand under a tree, where we had a bucket. It, the bucket had holes in it. They filled up the bucket and uh, she stood underneath. And the water was like the water in Scotland. She probably recognised it from the Balmoral area. It was, it was orange. <laughs> there was so much clay in it. There's a story about how, at night, these huge mice start to try and sort of throw themselves um, at the mosquito net. I always remember the first time she went to her room to bed and I was sort of tidying up somewhere and I suddenly heard her calling me, Anne, Anne, and I thought, oh, heavens, what's the matter? Went to her bedroom and she said, I've got flying mice in here. And I said, ma'am, I know she liked to drink, but I didn't think she drank all that much. <laughs> But it was quite true. There were these tiny mice and they ran up the mosquito nets and jumped from one... because there were two beds in her room, from her bed onto the other one. And I think she told the Queen, who simply didn't believe her, because I remember when I then saw the Queen, she said, Margaret had the most extraordinary story about flying mice. And I said, well, actually, it was true. There was no easy way for Princess Margaret to get to her plot of land. So she was forced to walk up to it. They had to trek along narrow paths where um, she might easily have got the royal leg scratched a bit. We dressed her in Colin's pyjamas. We tied string round her ankles and wrists. And out we went to find where we thought she'd like to build a house. And so we had this wonderful picture of, um, of her, the Queen's sister in uh, what presumably were oversized pyjamas. Uh, trekking over this very rough territory in very high temperatures. This is perched up very high with a wonderful view over the sea uh, below and of the bays and things. And so it must have been heaven to be up there. When Margaret saw the land, it said she wasn't totally happy with the size of it. He suddenly saw her taking the pegs out and disappearing off into the jungle. And Colin said, what are you doing, ma'am? And she said, well, I think I need a bit more land. Uh, so Colin said, why? And she said, well, I've got to have gatehouses for my security. She was very keen to have um, Oliver Messel design the house, partly because she loved his designs. He was a very, I mean, he was an eminent theatrical designer and she'd seen his house on Barbados and loved it. It is extraordinary that as Princess Margaret demanded more and more, she demanded perfection when the house was being designed, um, I don't think it ever occurred to her to offer to pay for, for some of the work. As work on Margaret's house got underway, Colin Tennant picked up the bill for everything. And soon, the princess realised that her new house could be the perfect place to invite her gentleman friends. It was a very discreet spot if she wanted to bring any lovers there. I think it was more because she needed to feel better about herself. She'd been rejected effectively by Tony and she didn't like it. One of the most persistent of Mustique rumours was that Princess Margaret met and had a relationship with a guy called John Bindon. Margaret first met John Bindon when he was on holiday on the island. He is supposed to have uh, shown his party trick to Princess Margaret. Apparently, John Bindon was famed for being able to lift a pint glass uh, with his member. The last thing Princess Margaret was was approved, so <laughs> she'd have loved his party trick and she'd have laughed. There was a photograph of them together, not, not in any compromising 
situation. But of course, the rumour mill went into overdrive and there was lots of speculation that they were having this clandestine, illicit affair. He certainly boasted about it and he, and he talked quite vividly about his uh, affair with, with Margaret. But maybe that was just him, but certainly the story took legs and subsequently there have been several films made about it. John Bindham's wasn't the only name romantically linked to the princess. Margaret was photographed with many men, like this one, where she looks captivated by the front man of the Rolling Stones. Mick Jagger was persuaded very early on, and apparently by Princess Margaret, he was persuaded to buy a house on Mystique, which he still has. Princess Margaret was great friends with Mick, and of course, of course they'd lived on the island together. People said they had an affair. That is absolutely untrue. Every time she enjoyed somebody's company or laughing with them or dancing with them, Peter immediately said, oh, she's having an affair with them. And it, absolutely untrue. There were always tons of rumours circulating about what was happening in uh, Mustique because it was such a party island and everybody did just mix. Everybody would go to each other's houses. Princess Margaret's house was finally completed in February 1972. It had four bedrooms, a swimming pool, and stunning views over the coast, as seen in these images from the ITV programme, Wish You Were Here. Princess Margaret christened her holiday getaway, Les Jolies Eaux, Pretty Waters. It was most often described as a villa the princess's Caribbean villa. And she didn't like that. She said, a villa? It's not a villa. It makes it sound like something you'd find in Brighton. She said it wasn't a villa. It was a single story house. It was amazing that um, she built a house and that, of course, encouraged other people to come. Interesting thing is it was really her, the only home she ever actually owned because in London, she lived at Kensington Palace, which was not, you know, which was just where princes and princesses live, but they don't own those places themselves. One thing that Princess Margaret put on the wall inside her house was a framed copy of Anagoni's portrait of the Queen. This stern portrait was an imposing reminder of her royal duty back home. You know, it was one place in the world that she could completely relax. She felt very free there. She felt she was able to, you know, just do, do things there that she couldn't possibly do at home. Princess Margaret's house on Mystique was one of 17 estates eventually designed and built on the island by Oliver Messel. But as the island developed and the rich and famous began to flock there, the press began sniffing around. And before too long, that would cause trouble. Princess Margaret's two lives, this party girl who loved living dangerously, combined with the formal role she had as the Queen's sister, was very soon to be thrown into chaos. Mystique had become Princess Margaret's special hideaway, not just from her royal duties, but from her marriage too, which was now in serious trouble. She was very angry about the allegations of, of his indiscretions, so I think she decided that she needed somewhere that she could escape to. But it wasn't just Lord Snowden who was having affairs. The princess now was seeking solace of her own outside the relationship, and word had reached the palace. The Queen would have known about the rumours surrounding her sister. She would have got involved because we know the Queen has always worried enormously about the reputation of the royal family. But also, we have to take the, the personal view. The Queen has always been very protective of her sister. And there was one relationship in particular that had been noticed. It began in 1973 when Princess Margaret met Roddy Llewellyn. Ruddy Llewellyn was, a, was originally produced as a sort of spare man by Anne Glen Connor at a house party in Glen. 
We were at Glen in Scotland, and it so happened that uh, some young man dropped out, and we wanted to uh, get the numbers straight. And I said to Colin, what are we to do? And so he said, well, I've got an aunt called Violet Wyndham. She was called Aunt Nose, because she had a very big nose, and knew everybody in London. So I rang her up and I said, by any chance, do you know anybody that might like to come up? And uh, she said, well, actually, as it happens, there's a young man called Roddy Llewellyn, I think Princess Margaret knows his father. And it just was, you know, I suppose, love at first sight. The princess herself was desperately unhappy. Meeting Roddy gave her back everything. They got on so well. They used to sit in the drawing room playing cards together. And, and I, I remember going for a walk quite early on with Roddy, and he said, oh, he said, Princess Margaret, so beautiful. Didn't realise she was so beautiful, uh, her eyes. And, and, I, and I just said to him, perhaps I shouldn't, I said, well, Roddy, you tell her, not me. I think Roddy's vulnerability appealed to Margaret. Also, he was very good looking. He was like a taller, better looking version of her husband. This intimate picture from Lady Anne Glenconner's selection shows them together in the early days of the relationship. They managed to keep things secret largely thanks to Margaret's house on Mustique. It was a most wonderful place for her, uh, you know, for them to be together. Well, I think the Mustique would be a, is a perfect place for anybody who's having a love affair. It, it's a perfect setting for that, because you've got the privacy, you've got the you know, all the beautiful weather and the beaches. Mystique gave the couple privacy and protection far away from prying eyes. He was always um, finding shells or doing something in the garden, because, of course, he was a gardener. And they were always sort of doing something together. Then, at some point in 1976, a press photographer arrived on the island. Colin Tennant had been a very jealous monitor of who could and who couldn't visit Mustique. But he had, at some time, then decided it was good for business to have upmarket groups visit the island. But in 1976, unknown to anybody on the island, one member of the group that had been allowed to visit was one of Rupert Murdoch's employees, uh, an Australian journalist, and he sees the moment with his long-distance lens. The photograph was taken, it was sent back to London. So the relationship became public knowledge. The photo, published in the News of the World, stunned Britain. It's pretty evident that they are in an intimate relationship and they're very, very close to each other. You can just tell that from the body language. But I think it was a pity it got out, you know. Prying into people's privacy. That, well, that's what the press do, don't they? The photo of Roddy and Margaret gripped the nation, and the press went into a frenzy. Lord Snowden, Princess Margaret's husband, was overseas at the time. I'm uh, naturally desperately sad in every way. He, he was furious because it, it, he looked like he'd been cuckolded by a younger man, and that didn't appeal to his vanity. Lord Snowden, is there any hope of a reconciliation? Thank you, ladies and It gave him the opportunity, in a sense, to look slightly like the, um, the wronged husband, which, of course, was very far from the truth. It was the final straw, really, in the marriage, because the following month, in March of 1976, uh, Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden officially separated. Although Margaret had endured years of infidelity, the public and the press now turned against her. In a sense, it opened the floodgates to press criticism and, and general criticism of, of the royal family. And once the press realised that they would sell more newspapers if they wrote about a princess behaving badly, they were on the lookout ever after for princes and princesses who were behaving badly. This ushered in, I think, a greater level of press intrusion into the royal family. After the images of Roddy on Mustique emerged, 
Talk turned to the possibility of the first royal divorce in four centuries. It was a bruising time for Princess Margaret. She had lost public support because I think people were quite horrified by the Roddy Llewellyn affair. So, you know, her rating with the public had fallen hugely. Once again, Margaret turned to her sanctuary, Mustique. Margaret's separation had put pressure on her relationship with her sister, who'd always hoped that the marriage could be saved. But in 1977, the Queen paid a visit to her sister on Mustique. The Queen was on a Silver Jubilee tour of the Caribbean. She still had the Royal Yacht Britannia, so they were able to pay Princess Margaret a visit. Margaret was absolutely delighted when the Jubilee tour of 77 bought the Queen and Prince Philip to Mystique. I mean, she'd been longing to show her sister her house. You know, Colin was so excited to have them there, of course. Well, we were all absolutely thrilled, I can't tell you. Uh, Colin nearly fainted with pleasure, but <laughs> he thought he'd never get the Queen to come to Mustique, and, but uh, it was tremendous. Anwar Hussain was one of the few photographers permitted to capture the extraordinary moment. The Queen visited her sister on the island. The Queen was on Britannia, and I had a number of uh, the PR. I rang him and I said, look, we want to come and it's a historic moment. Queen has never been to Mustique, and it's, they like these sort of pictures I did of Queen looking more natural. It would be Queen Elizabeth's first time on the island that had meant so much to her sister over the years. I had a little boat to bring them into a little jetty. See the way they arrived. They had made a special crown, and and uh, and where she they walked through it, and it was sort of. Very rustic, and the little kids, local kids, came and joined, dressed as fairies. And it, I think it was quite a little personal touch. The locals were meticulously coached for the monarch's arrival. I taught them how to curtsy and taught the men how to bow. And um, I said, you know, when the Queen comes, you stand up. Well, when the Queen got off, they never moved. They sat absolutely on their seats. And I could see her so graciously going and looking and smiling. Uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, of course, being the Duke of Edinburgh, the minute he got off, he turned to Colin, he sort of took a look round the island and said, I, I can see you've ruined the island. And Colin was actually quite sad, rather dashed by that. During the Queen's visit to Mustique, um, the the partying, the the scent, the extravagance, the outrageousness that would have all been put on hold. Um, Colin Tennant would have been on his best behaviour. Um, she would have visited her sister's house, but it would have been very very low key, no wild parties. The vehicle laid on for the Queen to travel the island was rather different to what she might have been used to back home. If you see the pictures, you know, uh, of her getting into it. Uh, VW Combis instead of Rolls Royce. They all got into it, and I think it's quite a different than the lifestyle in England. I'm very relaxed about it. Despite the very informal feel, the trip was a success. And when they got to Macaroni Beach, it was so wonderful that the Duke of Edinburgh swam from one side of the bay to the other, and the Queen uh, jumped into the sea. I think the fact that the Queen went swimming in Mustique shows you how secluded um, Macaroni Bay was, particularly to think that, you know, the Queen was able to, to swim without prying eyes and, and nice to know that the Queen got to do something just fun for her um, and wasn't always on duty. And I think what was nice was she had a lovely relaxing day. Just one or two people had lunch with her and Princess Margaret. Colin and I did, obviously. Um, and she had a, a, you know, and she went round the island. And, I, and she, you know, I think really what she was so pleased about was that Princess Margaret was so happy. It had been a moment of lightness for Margaret and her sister during a difficult time. The year after the Queen's visit to Mystique, Margaret's divorce from Lord Snowden was finalised. It was a significant moment in royal history. The Queen's reaction, of course, understandably, was one of concern because she'd always wanted Princess Margaret and Tony to make the best of the marriage, to patch it up. She didn't want 
divorce uh, within the family. If Margaret thought her divorce would draw a line under things, she was wrong. The public and press remained hostile, and soon they were baying for blood. Of course, at this point in British modern history, the country is going through a very, very difficult time. And there's a lot of industrial unrest, um, you know, there's a lot of poverty, there are strikes, and there's a lot of criticism that she's off having a jolly in Mustique on the taxpayers' expense. I think that ought to be a cost-benefit analysis of the royal family expenditure on income. Two MPs rounded on Margaret as a parasite royal, having a good time on the public purse. Dennis Canavan and Willie Hamilton were two of Princess Margaret's most vociferous critics in Parliament and uh, Willie Hamilton calling her a floozy. I think that Princess Margaret was an easy target for a man like Willie Hamilton, yes, because Mustique is a paradise island and it does have parties and people uh, don't go there to work, they go there to relax. So you could present it very much as her neglecting her duties. Over the next 10 years, Margaret's royal duties reduced significantly and she was free to spend more time on the island. But the hedonistic party days were starting to take their toll. After a turbulent time on and off Mystique during the 1970s, Princess Margaret finally separated from Roddy Llewellyn in 1980. The princess's relationship with Roddy had lasted for eight years. Um, but in 1981, he married a very charming and talented lady called Tania Soskin. She knew Roddy wanted to get married, she accepted it, she made friends with his wife so that, you know, she would be able to see him again. And when he had his three lovely daughters, um, you know, she was always interested in them. Margaret remained officially single for the rest of her life, but she still loved a good party. And in 1986, Colin Tennant hosted a celebration for his 60th birthday on Mystique. And it was a glamorous and opulent affair. Colin had chartered this enormous great 400-foot uh, sailing vessel. And so again, the great and the good were treated to a week, a week of wonderful parties culminating in the, in, in the Peacock Ball. We started off in St. Lucia, we went to Martinique, and then we had parties on all the different islands. Princess Margaret didn't come on the boat. She was in her house in Mustique, and she gave a wonderful lunch, uh, which was a sort of, uh, a, a sort of festival of, of sort of uh, bobbing apples, champagne. Anyway, it took two years to plan this party, and we had special dresses for about six people, including Princess Margaret. The Peacock Ball was a star-studded night, as this extraordinary photograph shows. But royal tradition dictated that Princess Margaret should be the last to arrive. Princess Margaret was not going to arrive until all the guests had arrived. Um, and there was one to come, who, of course, was Raquel Welsh. Anyway, eventually, there was a stalemate, and the uh, Princess Margaret then came in and was greeted by uh, Colin and Anne, and then Raquel Welsh came in. Raquel Welsh uh, was always late for everything, so she actually was later than Princess Margaret, which was slightly irritated Princess Margaret because she's always meant to be the last person to arrive. As seen in this intriguing photograph, the evening saw Colin adorned in a crown of his own. The, the, the culmination was the, the crowning of Colin as the King of Mustique. Uh, by Princess Margaret, which, of course, was a joke because Mustique is part of uh, sovereign territory. Though what these remarkable pictures don't show is that there was also lots of alternative entertainment available. Effectively, pornographic films were shown, and it's difficult to know what Margaret would have made of, of, the, of the adult films, but I think by now she thought, well, whatever I do, there's a chance that someone will find out and I need to live my life, so I'll, I'll take the risk. It would be one of the last great mystique parties that Colin would throw and Princess Margaret would attend, as her hedonistic lifestyle would eventually catch up with her. Well, Margaret had always been a smoker and she'd always been a drinker. And 
Eventually, this took a, a toll on her health, and she had part of her lung removed, which is, in fact, what had happened to her father, King George VI. Whilst Mustique was the location for some of the best times of her life, it was also where her well-being began to suffer. In the 90s, Margaret really saw her health decline, and she ended up having a couple of small strokes while she was at Mustique. On her way to a hospital in Barbados this evening, Princess Margaret, with sun hat and sunglasses, before tests to see how soon she can return to Britain to convalesce after her mild stroke. The most significant event, however, was when Princess Margaret suffered severe burns to her feet in 1999. The uh, thermostat on the boiler uh, wasn't working properly, and she thought she was turning off the um, hot tap. She turned off the cold, and this boiling water, she was standing up, went straight on our feet. She rang me up, and she said, Anne, I don't want anybody coming in except you. And I looked after night and day, and I remember one day I was quite tired because, you know, I, she, I had to help her in the night if she wanted to go to the bathroom and that sort of thing. And so I said, would you mind? She had two single beds in our room. I said, would you mind if I got into the next door bed and we could watch some videos and, you know, I could be company. Oh, she said, yes, is it like boarding school? Because, of course, she'd never been to boarding school. I said, it is a bit, except at boarding school, you can't lie in bed watching videos. But, uh, and, uh, you know, first and only time I did ring the Queen up, I said, ma'am, could you help? And um, I, the doctor thinks she's well enough to go on Concord, because in those days, Concord came to um, Barbados. Yeah. So we flew back, and she went to hospital. But she, her feet really never, never recovered. By this time, Les Jolies Eaux had been gifted to Margaret's son, Viscount David Linley. The villa had been signed over to him to celebrate his 1996 wedding to Serena Stanhope. I think that, that most people like a sense of continuity and I think Princess Margaret probably did hope that it would go on being a, a happy home for for her descendants. But as with so much in her life, Princess Margaret's hopes and dreams did not quite come into fruition. In 1999, Viscount Linley put the villa up for sale. So Princess Margaret was really upset when her son decided to sell Les Joliot because this was the only thing that she really owned in her own right. When you bear in mind what it had actually meant to her for so long. It, um, it, it, I think it hurt her very much. The villa was sold to new owners in the year 2000, and just two years later, Princess Margaret died. Draped in her own blue and crimson standard, Princess Margaret's coffin leaves the King Edward VII Hospital late this afternoon. Her ashes were placed in a tomb with her father, King George VI. It had been a life well lived, and Princess Margaret's time on Mystique had scaled the highest highs and touched some of the lowest lows. I think lots of Margaret's life became so entwined with Mustique, you know, the, the high points of her life, you know, the hedonism, the partying, the love affairs, but also the bad times as well. Um, the scandal of her affair with Roddy becoming public and um, the heartache that that brought her and the rest of the royal family. And of course, some of her health issues. There's little doubt Princess Margaret's life on Mystique did much to change the perception of royalty in the 20th century. She opened up the family, not just to the reality of divorce, but then she also opened up the royal family to the kind of criticism that we saw with Prince Charles, that we saw with um, uh, the Duchess of York and Prince Andrew. Probably none of that, or much less of that criticism, that focus would have happened but for Princess Margaret's behavior on Mustique. Margaret's legacy will forever be tied to an island a little more than two miles across, 4,000 miles away. Okay, Colin bought the island, Colin developed the island, it became this hedonistic paradise. But it was Princess Margaret that put it on the map. And it was the only place in the world where she actually had a home that she could call her own. The Queen thanked Colin and me for giving Princess Margaret so, so much happiness in her life with Mustique, you know. I, I felt so quite relieved that she felt that we had, you know, what, what we had done for Princess Margaret, she did approve of. 
Exploring the challenges of coping with bereavement, six extraordinary people share their story with Esther Ranson, Living with Grief, a brand new documentary Thursday at 10. After the break, our Wakefield wonder is bringing down the house with talent from screen and stage. Jane McDonald and Friends is next.